Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We're now come to our ninth lesson of this first quarter of 2022. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. Of course, the entire book that we're studying is the book of Hebrews, which yes. talks about the priestly work of Jesus Christ. And none of that priestly work would work if it weren't for the sacrifice that also was accomplished by That's Jesus right. Christ. So we're going to look this week at the purpose and the nature of Christ's sacrifice on Calvary and its role in our redemption. Okay, And that's a nice summary there uh, in Sabbath afternoon where it says, This week we will look at the cross as it appears in the book of Hebrews. So it's a very straightforward uh, uh, topic that we're looking at, but there's still a great amount of insight and wisdom we can gain and blessing. So before we get into our talking points proper, why don't you give us a word of prayer? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your word, especially now, Lord, the book of Hebrews as we're going through it and, and how it speaks present to your truth to uh, the time we're living in. We just ask, Lord, that you would bless our study of it, bless those classes around the world who will be reviewing this lesson. May it strengthen us all for the day of Jesus Christ and give us confidence and hope in his sacrifice and his priestly ministry on our behalf. For we ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So again, this week we're focusing exclusively on the sacrifice aspect of Christ's work for us. Right. And talking points go along with that. Number one, talking point number one, sacrifice was the central feature of sanctuary services. Right. And we're going to see all the way back from Eden and through, and we won't get into it, but that's covering from Sunday and Monday's lessons. Talking point number two, the sacrifice of Jesus is unique and essential. That's all about uh, Tuesday's lesson, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And finally, talking point number three, Christ's sacrifice qualifies him to be our mediator and judge. So all the things that he does in heaven are based on the qualification of his sacrifice, right. Wednesday and Thursday. So let's just walk through it in order, shall we? Yes, the central feature. Yes, the central feature of sanctuary, of sanctuary services, even before the sanctuary services. Now, I've included a few texts in here and a few thoughts that were not actually included in the lesson. Because what happens is, on Sunday's lesson, the question, uh, the title of the lesson is, Why Were Sacrifices Needed? And it launches into uh, the kind of the history of covenant agreements, and it looks at, but it picks it up with, with Abraham and going forward. But I wanted to bring out the point that this idea of sacrifice is not something that God added to his people's relationship with him later on in the history mm -hmm. of the world. It actually started from the moment there was sin at all. That's right. And let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If you want to read that for us. And I'll get ready for Revelation. Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, and we re referenced this last week in our lesson, uh, the, the, the Lord is speaking to the serpent there in the Garden of Eden, and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. All right, so the bruising, or in some versions, the crushing of his head. Now, if you look at verse 21 of the mm -hmm. same chapter... What does that one say? Verse 21. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I jumped across the page. It was like his brother's name was Jubal. <laughs> it's a great passage. Uh, yes. <laughs> also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed, clothed them. Right. So that the clothing by God of Adam and Eve with the sacrifice of an animal in response yes. to their sin, this idea of sacrifice, which would be from the Lord himself, is right there in the beginning of you know, the foundation of the world, which is exactly what Revelation 13, verse 8 talks about. Well, it's, it's interesting. It doesn't, the sacrifice is not implicit in Genesis 3. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm going to put enmity between, then he clothed them with skins. Right. Like, where did the skins come from? Exactly. And then we come to Revelation 13, and it talks about Christ being the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You see it has reference here. The skin had exactly to come from right. something. And if you go right to Genesis 4, yes. there's that other story, which yes. we don't have to you know, read, Elaborate on. But, but you know the story of Cain and Abel, and when they both brought sacrifices. Right. Where'd they get the instruction to do that? Right, so there was a concept of sacrifice That's and a right. building of an altar, but 
One was a sacrifice merely of fruit and grain and whatnot, and the other was the blood sacrifice that the Lord had actually required. That's right. Now, commenting on this, and I put it in the notes here, yes. I want you to read Patriots and Prophets, page 72, that statement. Cain obeyed in building an altar, obeyed in bringing a sacrifice, but he rendered only a partial obedience. The essential part, the recognition of the need of a redeemer, was left out. And of course, you recall that the sacrifice he brought was a grain offering. Right. It was more of a thank offering. Mm -hmm. and, and you think of the two worshipers in the temple where the one came to God and said, thank you, God, that I'm not like as oh, bad wow. as those guys. Yeah. yeah. And where the, the, the Pharisee, but the mm -hmm. publican, the tax collector comes, he says, Lord, have True mercy contrition. on me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. And you see those two types of sacrifice with Cain and Abel. That's a great point to bring out. And so, again, the point that we're making here is that sacrifice has always been the essential symbol of salvation. Mm -hmm. God didn't have something, and then he later on added some sacrifices in. It's been and, from the very and beginning. And what's fascinating is the sacrifice from the beginning represented the sacrifice God was making for humanity, not something humanity was giving to God. Exactly, right. Which that's became a very distorted. Good point. The devil distorted that later in paganism. It's like, no, you got to pay off your gods, but that's not what sacrifice well, was originally. In fact, if we go to the story in Revelation, um, Genesis 15, mm -hmm. later on, still in that same yeah. beginning book of the Bible, the Lord Himself puts Himself into the sacrificial process system when He, again, we don't need to read through the mm -hmm. whole story, but uh, basically what happened is the Lord is speaking to Abraham here and He reiterates His covenant uh, of salvation mm -hmm. and He instructs Him to sacrifice these animals and cut them into pieces, two pieces, so that makes an aisle down the middle of these carcasses, right? Yes. And in the, apparently in the old, you know, ancient tradition, yes. that you would do this, basically saying the terms that we've it's, agreed it's to... It's a Middle East term, uh, standard Middle East covenant that they right. made in those days. And that if We're, anyone, any party breaks their end of the covenant, may what happened to these animals happen right. to me, right? And you would expect him to say, now you walk through this, but the Lord himself walked through the middle. He right. put his, he has His's skin presence. in the game, mm -hmm. you know? Anyway, and that's where in Hebrews 7, 22, where it talks about Jesus being the surety and the guarantee of our salvation, that he puts himself into this covenantal sacrifice position, essentially from the foundation of the world and on through. I, I don't know why it's coming to mind right now, but you remember Gideon and when he appeared, when the Lord appeared to Gideon and he offered sacrifice and then he, the Lord rose up in the flames, in the in the smoke, and what ha have you, mm. the sacrifice. Like, s repeated symbolism of the Lord, like, mm. the sacrifice was him. And mm. He was the... Well, and of course, you think of Abraham in Genesis 22, when the Lord, he's going to sacrifice his own son, yes. and the Lord said, no, no, I've got one, and I'm going to provide. The Lord will provide. So over and over, the Christ Lord... Christ has always been the sacrifice. Amen. That's yeah. the point. Now... I did want to highlight something that was brought Which out. Which is the foundation. That was your point. Sacrifice has been an essential symbol of salvation because the sacrifice was Christ. And that's the right. foundation. That's of, the whole point. Yeah. If you look at Monday's lesson, uh, paragraph one, why don't you read the first two sentences of Monday there? I thought that was an interesting comment. Jesus' death provided forgiveness or remission for our sins. The remission of our sins, however, involves much more than the cancellation of the penalty for our transgression of the covenant. Mm. Now think about that. So the remission of sins involves more than just forgiveness of the past, calling it mm -hmm. good, right? That there's a there's a broader understanding of what the sacrifice was supposed to represent. That's right. And thus, whenever you get into, I was t talking to Pastor Howard about this in our in our pre meeting here. How it's sometimes I'm I'm going to be going to Leviticus one, just so you know, but. We lose track, sometimes we get in the details of the story. If you pull back from 30,000 feet and look at the story of the Exodus and the Ten Commandments given in Exodus chapter 20, in 25 you have the sanctuary set up, and for the rest of the book of Exodus, except for the disobedience of the people with the golden calf right. issue in Exodus 33, the rest of the book of Exodus is building the physical structure of the sanctuary. Right. And it culminates at the end when God inhabits his sanctuary so much with such power and glory that even Moses is pushed out and everybody has to get out. Then you turn the page to Leviticus chapter 1 and picking up the baton right where it left off in Exodus at the end, verse 1 says, Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of meeting. So he inhabits the tabernacle and then speaks. Speak to the children of Israel, verse 2, and say to them, When any of you, one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of the livestock, of the herd and of the flock. So he doubles down. He reiterates this sacrificial system in the sanctuary services. But 
as the lesson rightly points out in um, Monday's lesson, that as you read through Leviticus there in chapter 1, it's talking about the, the Holocaust or the, the burnt offering. Then you have chapter 2, the grain offering. Chapter 3, the peace offering. Chapter 4, the sin mm -hmm. offering. Chapter 5, the trespass offering. Everything dealing with the, the life of the sinner, not just his old sins, but everything that it involved in his, his daily experience was predicated on a sacrifice for something, right? A sacrifice to the Lord. And what does it say there? I, I just was, I, I, I was drawn back to, even in the preparation of the sanctuary, there had to be a sacrifice to consecrate the sanctuary itself, mm. even before anybody went in to offer, you know, to, mm -hmm. on behalf of the people. Mm. So just, again, that centrality it's, of sacrifice. Everything is built everything. on the sacrifice yeah. concept. It was over and over again. Now, where were we looking? Uh, uh, se the, se the seventh paragraph, the last paragraph of Monday's lesson. Oh, Why yes. don't you read that for us? Yeah, the sanctuary sacrifice... Uh, the sacred sac sacrifices teach us that the experience of salvation is more than just accepting Jesus as our substitute. We also need to feed on him, share his benefits with others, and provide reparation to those whom we have wronged. Now think about the gravity of this. Now, if I had written this sentence, this first sentence, you, somebody going to call me a legalist, <laughs> right? The sanctuary sacrifices teach us that the experience no, of salvation... They just contributor less than the legalist. Right, exactly. Habit. But the experience of salvation is more yes. than just accepting Jesus as our substitute. Well, but let's be clear before we throw stones, anybody throws stones yeah. at the contributor lesson, he's just building on the reality that the no, he's sanctuary right. service, there was not just one sacrifice. Like, if it's mm -hmm. so simple and straightforward, like, it just means that... Why all the different sacrifices, all the different facets, all the different things? And you couldn't, you couldn't just bring a sin offering. You had to bring a burnt offering with the sin offering mm. for it to be acceptable. Like all of these different things. Because it, it, the Lord had to use all of these to give us the comprehensive view. Yes. Like one type wasn't able to clarify. And that's the, that's the underlying point is that not the only is Jesus... The effects of salvation. Right. Not only is Jesus the sacrifice, but there's more to the sacrificial understanding right. than we typically assign to it, right? We, we focus so much on the substitute aspect that I'm really glad that they brought this out, that there's more than just the substituting for the sins past, but there's the renewed life is also exactly found in him right. that's predicated on that sacrifice. And of course, the this is the, the foundation of Paul's argument in Hebrews, and he's trying to then elaborate on how Christ's priestly ministry is affecting all of these things. Yes. I mean, and that's where we move into our second talking point, how the sacrifice of Jesus is unique and essential because yes. we've had sacrifices since, again, since Adam fell with Cain and Abel, with Abraham, mm -hmm. with Moses and the Israelites all through the time. But somehow, in several ways, the sacrifices, the sanctuary itself, the priests ministering those sacrifices were all insufficient to our true spiritual needs. Yes. They were symbolic. I have it mm -hmm. in the notes as the earthly sanctuary ceremonies, though spiritually significant, they were highly significant, deeply solemn, were still merely symbolic. Mm -hmm. They were intended, they were limited by the mortality of the priests. And let's look up a couple of these texts real quick. Yeah. Hebrews 7, 23. What does that tell us, Mark? Hebrews Sorry to put you on the spot. I should have had it coming. Yeah, you should have. You know, we should look up more texts just so people can breathe this a little bit. This is how bit. it is every day here, folks. <laughs> Michigan Conference Office. No, just to be... 723. 723. And there were many priests because... Rather, he says also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. And of course he contrasts with Jesus right. because he lives forever. Right, continue. So the, one of the limitations is that they all die. Right. So you have to, a good priest, oh, no, next priest, next priest, next priest, and just over and over priest, priest. It's hard for us to get the grasp of this too, like a, like a, a you know, a maybe person who has, they're still religious systems that have priests and what have you, but mm. you have a, a counselor or somebody you, you know, run things by and it's very mm -hmm. important to that, and then they're gone. And, and start it's again. like, yeah. you got to start all over. And this person, they know now where you're coming from and all mm -hmm. of this. And from a spiritual standpoint, that priest, you know, all that you had shared with that priest and they'd instructed you and then you got to start over again. Right. So the priests themselves were limited by their, first of all, they were imperfect. They were, right. they were sinful and they die. they're mortal. They die. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, then you go to Hebrews 9. Right. And it says here. Verse 9, what's the issue with the sacrifices themselves that they were offering? 
Why don't you read that for us? It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Okay, so the problem with the priests is that they're limited by their sin and their mortality. Mm -hmm. The problem with the sacrifices is that they're ineffective. They don't actually yes. do what we're really needing it to do. That's right. And so no wonder we need a Jesus. We need a true sacrifice who can mm -hmm. do what all these were pointing to, but he needed to be the reality. Okay. Absolutely. So if let's look at Hebrews 7, 24 to 27. What does that teach us there? 724, because, I'm sorry, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and, ha and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Mm. And of course, the verse 28 continues with that idea, mm -hmm. but, the, but the idea that Paul is laying out here in Hebrews is that he's piece by piece talking about the, the significance of the Old Testament sanctuary and uh, ceremonial law, but then talks about its limitations, that it is, it's limited by death, it's limited by sin, and the sacrifices, I mean, they're just animals. Right. But Jesus himself, it says, is better, and thus we needed him to be the high priest for our salvation. So sticking with Hebrews 7, look at verse 11, if you would. Hebrews 7, 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Now, he asks a rhetorical question there. And he says, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was that another priest should arise, mm -hmm. right? The idea being that given all the limitations we've discussed, both in the priesthood and in the sacrifice, that we need a better priest, a better sacrifice. We need a different type of mediator than the ones that the earth could offer. And so when Jesus comes into the picture, into this frame, he makes up for all those limitations where all those are symbolic. He is the reality and he is the embodiment of all those things that they were pointing to. I was looking at uh, and I was trying to find, find a reference in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 28, which we didn't read. We read up to 27. It says the law points as high priests, men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law, appoints the Son mm -hmm. who has been perfected forever. Yes. And then adding to that thought, the Apostle Paul in chapter 10, verse 14 says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And it's a fascinating, mm. like, so the perfected forever is past tense. Mm -hmm. But those who are being sanctified is present tense. Right. And it just... It, what it's speaking to is just what you're saying, that the sacrifice of Christ was totally efficacious. It was complete. It was every, there's everything in it mm -hmm. to do for us what needs to be done. But, and it's by virtue of that perfect sacrifice. There never needs to be another one that our sanctification process is going on. Mm -hmm. But it's because of the all, like I said, all the uh, all encompassing nature of the sacrifice of Christ. Beautiful. That, yeah. Anyway. Absolutely. Well, in Hebrews 9 is my next passage I want to look at here. Let's go to chapter 9, starting with verse 9, where it says, uh, through 15, it was symbolic for the present time in which mm -hmm. both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerned only with food and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of the Reformation. But, verse 11, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, which of course be the holy places once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And listen to the logic, it was verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the, for the purifying of the flesh, so if it did its limited job, right, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Mm -hmm. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, 
for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So it talks about how for this reason, Christ is unique. He is, he is different than the blood of goats and bulls because if symbolically they can feel better about their lives, but that really didn't change, Christ can do in reality what all those could only do in a symbolic uh, representation way. Well, it's, it's helpful that that brings out the idea of cleansing the conscience from dead works. In verse 9, it said that the problem with the earthly system was that it could not make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Mm -hmm. doesn't describe, what does it mean perfect in regard to the conscience? Well, he fills that in when he says that um, the conscience... He's able to, Christ is able to cleanse the conscience from dead works. I mean, there's only one of two ways I can figure to get to cleanse your conscience. Either you, in the biblical terminology, you sear your conscience, right? It just, mm. it doesn't bother you what you, no, no, I'm sorry, three, your conscience is supposed to bother you when you sin. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's, that's the, what it's that's talking about, is that yeah. agitation. To cleanse it means either you stop sinning or you sear it so you don't feel it when you're sinning. Mm. Now, Christ is going to do one or the other. Which one is he going to do? <laughs> right. I think it's pretty obvious, but yeah. if there was any question, Paul clarifies it. He's going to cleanse your conscience from those dead works. In other words, you're going to stop doing those things that mm. that irritate, that cause you a guilty conscience. Right. Because he's able to you mm. know, save to the uttermost all who come to God. So together. there's a power of Christ in his mediator work not only to declare that you have been cleansed from your past record, but there's a power so that your conscience in its living, active, daily interactions won't have the same issues it had before because he can give you victory. And over the dead works. Over those dead works. And so yeah. now I don't have a conscience bothering me because I didn't do a thing today. It was praise the Lord. That's it's a right. better day than it was yesterday because we have Jesus. Mm. Well, this brings us nicely to our final talking point. That is Christ's sacrifice qualifies him to be our mediator and judge that the, the death of Jesus not only establishes him as our intercessor to, you know, go between God and man, but also to be the judge and in that work of judgment to finally cleanse the entire universe of this problem of sin. Mm -hmm. And Christ is uniquely suited for this job. Let's go to Wednesday, paragraph one. Why don't you read that for us, please? The idea that the heavenly sanctuary needs cleansing makes sense in the context of the Old Testament sanctuary. The sanctuary is a symbol of God's government, and the way God deals with the sin of his people affects the public perception of the righteousness of his government. As ruler, God is is that... Well, I was looking specifically when God forgives the sinner, he carries this... Ju mm -hmm. He uses this term, when God forgives the sinner, he carries judicial responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's an interesting turn of phrase. I'm not sure I've heard invoked that often, but it does seem to make sense. Well, that... let me interject this, and Please. I think this is where you're going and where the lesson touches on. It makes this point, that this, first of all, that the symbols, the sanctuary is a symbol of God's government. Uh, I don't know that a lot of people process through that, okay. but God's throne, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant is it's a symbol in the of yeah. God's throne, and the law is underneath Mm -hmm. The lid of the that mercy seat, it's the foundation, which is the foundation of any government. So, uh, I think it's a po uh, it's a powerful statement that the lesson makes there. Yes, and the sin then being transferred to the sanctuary, as we're going to refer to here, is where basically, I mean, when Lucifer sinned, he was cast out of heaven. Mm -hmm. But we sin, and God says, "I'm going to bring you into heaven." And yeah. that causes a how little bit work? of... Yeah. Right, how does that work? So God's bearing a level of responsibility. We're talking about judicial responsibility. Yeah. Like, how can you be fair and you're doing this? And a text that comes to my mind is in Romans chapter 2, where Paul speaks to the Jews in his day, and he says, um, verse 21, You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples of their idols, right? You mm -hmm. hoard them to yourself. You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, mm. as it is written. Mm. So he's making a clear statement. And I know I'm reading this because I know Christians, I know Seventh-day Adventists like, oh, uh, God's not affected. God's reputation isn't affected by what we do. Mm. He doesn't need any level of vindication. You're arguing with the Apostle Paul here. Mercy. Paul says that when 
the person who claims to follow God does these things. He's blaspheming the name of God among others who say, oh, you believe in God and you're doing that? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a misrepresentation. So now God, God's dealing with sin is bringing a reflection on his judicial, mm -hmm. on his justice. It's government as a whole. Are, yeah. you, are you a just God or not? How could you let these things mm -hmm. happen? So, Well, and, and interestingly enough, when Jesus, we, we sometimes use such fuzzy language, but let's think about what's actually happening here. Here, God's people have sinned against mm -hmm. his own law, but they're his people. So he says, I'm going to take that sin from you, praise the Lord, mediate yeah. it, offer, you know, my my righteousness and your, mm -hmm. okay, but he doesn't just take that sin and then say, and it just disappears. He applies it just like the Old Testament outlined to the sanctuary itself. And so there is necessary in the Old Testament symbols in Leviticus 16 and in the New Testament, as Hebrews points out, that there is a need to cleanse the sanctuary itself because God's throne, his government, his name is polluted by our sins, That's right? right? That's why we read in Hebrews 9. This is 9, not a physical cleansing of bloodstains. Right. It's a symbolic cleansing of sin. Right. The significance mm -hmm. is the important thing. Look at verse 23 of Hebrews 9. Therefore, mm -hmm. after it outlines how the Old Testament uh, sanctuary, the earthly sanctuary is cleansed in the, in the Day of Atonement, right? Right. It says, therefore, in verse 23, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And the implication of that statement is the heavenly things themselves need purification with yes. better sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So somehow our sin pollutes the government, the judicial mm -hmm. oversight of God. Mm -hmm. And so... Christ is not only the sacrifice that gives us the opportunity for salvation and the priest who offers that to us in this place, but then he is seated as judge over this whole process. That's right. That's why we see um, in the Wednesday, and we don't have time to read through it now, but uh, paragraph three really does a nice job of outlining the two phases of the work of Christ. One, to to offer himself as the sacrifice we need to for right. remission of sin, but then the cleansing of the sanctuary itself as the role of priest, right? Yes. And John chapter 5, Jesus declared when he came to there, he says, and this is verses 22 and 23, a paraphrase, but essentially that God the Father doesn't do the judgment. He's committed that. Now, God is still right. the oversight, but he entrusts Christ with this. He has given mm -hmm. Christ this work of judgment because, because, he is the son of because man. he's the Son of Man. Because he's been the perfect life and the death, and he's been raised. He mm -hmm. is uniquely qualified for this special work of cleansing this mm -hmm. universe from sin. I want you to read this powerful insight from a, uh, Testimonies, Volume 9. Page 186. Yes. Christ has been made our judge. The Father is not the judge. The angels are not. He who took humanity upon himself and in this world lived a perfect life is to judge us. He only can be our judge. Will you remember this, brethren? Will you remember it, ministers? Will you remember it, fathers and mothers? Christ took humanity that he might be our judge. Mm. That mm -hmm. there, there is a significance to that that I mm -hmm. think we need to marinate in a little bit. We need to meditate upon that because when we think of judging, sometimes we think of, well, probably all kinds of misrepresentations, but the same Jesus who came down here in the first place, the same Jesus who sacrificed himself, the same Jesus who offers that sacrifice to us in his mediatorial role, now sits as judge because his goal isn't to just always forgive. He wants to be done with sin in his entire creation. Well, probably the most common retort to somebody judging is, who are you to judge me? And mm -hmm. Jesus can say, I'm one of you. Yeah. Well, he was the creator. He he ascend, He descended to become one of us. He's right. There's no one in the universe. But who when can we, do this when work. a person says that, they're saying you don't know my situation. And the point is that mm. there, Jesus understands intimately. That's the point that is being made here. That he is not the Father. It's not the angels. He who took humanity. He knows what we've gone through. He's experienced. The, mm. the, the, he was tempted in all points like as we are. Exactly. Else. I was going to say, that's a, a reference to Hebrews chapter 4, that the high priest that we have, and again, the high priest's work was on the Day of Atonement, the judgment, right. and it's because he's our high priest that we can appeal to him because he's been where we are yet without sin. Amen. Thus, we come to the end of our conclusion here. De Desire of Ages 19 and 20, you'll find this in quarterly uh, pr Friday's lesson, paragraph 2. Why don't you read that for us? Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. 
it will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is a law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeketh not her own has its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. Mm. Mm. When we look to Jesus and his sacrifice, we have all that we need, not only for you know, remission of past sins, but to be part of his kingdom forever when there will be no more sin at all. Amen. And that's exciting. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, and particularly as his sacrifice is so much more than the symbols that pointed forward to it. Thank you for Jesus being a reality. Thank you that he's our priest, our mediator, and our judge. Lord, help us as we look to Jesus to come boldly before the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. For we pray it in Jesus' name.